Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of the Dr. Will Show, where I interview educators and entrepreneurs on leveling up. Each episode, I zoom with someone who's dope, and we just sit back and have a conversation on what it means to live your best life. Now, if this is your first time checking out the podcast, this is the Mobile University for Entrepreneurs, and I'm your host, Dr. Will. Now, today's guest is Ty Abrams. We were and are got connected on, oh my gosh, it is the Instagram, and uh, she's doing some awesome things. Uh, she has a partner, they create, they co-founded a nonprofit. We're going to get into that and, and the work that they're doing, and hopefully for you as an educator who may want to have that bigger audience, may want to make the impact, and maybe consulting may not be your thing, maybe creating that nonprofit is. So we're going to get you get that information that'll help you get started. So for those who be listening on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Simplecast, Stitcher, and Spotify, will you please introduce yourself, Ty? Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Ty Abrams, and I am the founder and CEO of Admission Squad, uh, an education nonprofit based out of Brooklyn, New York, that helps talented students from underserved backgrounds place into New York City's elite high schools. I'm also a best-selling author of the book, Who Am I? An A to Z Career Guide for Teens. And I speak at a variety of arenas uh, providing exceptional coaching uh, to schools, principals, guidance counselors, and parents on how they can better advocate for their children. Brooklyn, is that Jay-Z? That's Jay-Z. <laughs> <laughs> And many others, okay? <laughs> all right, all right. So I'm always curious as to how people got to where they are. What do you think you would be doing when you were growing up? And what drew you to education? My original dream career was to be an investment banker. I wanted to have my corner office, be a managing director, running the show. And I did start my career off as an investment banker. I went to Duke University for undergrad, majored in mathematics, and had an opportunity to intern as an investment banking analyst. And I got a chance to see the sales and trading floor while in college. And while that was an amazing opportunity, I was not exactly fulfilled. The hours were exceptionally long. I definitely made a lot of money, but I wasn't really fulfilling my purpose. I went on to start off my career as a government consultant working for Booz Allen Hamilton in Washington, DC. And again, it was a really cool experience, great networking opportunity, but I was on a mission to have an impact. So I quickly transitioned to a program called Teach for America, where I was able to really learn about this achievement gap that was facing our children. And I decided I wanted to be a part of that in some way. Mm. I thought about being an investment banker too, until I looked in the car, the, the, the school's catalog for uh, finance majors. And I saw like Cal three and all of that stuff. And I said, well, I, that's not going to be a career. Oh, you should have done it. I, I could have tutored you. <laughs> what, from the womb? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <You're on laughs> yeah, I'm 46 years old. I'm like, wow. Uh, so I want to ask you about this because I am from Mississippi. And what makes, I think, Mississippi... Louisiana and Alabama very different from a lot of places is we have like real sort of uh, not necessarily the neighborhood schools, but area schools. So if you live within a specific area, you will go to the same school. Doesn't even matter what your parents do for a living, uh, what have you. If you live in a certain area, you go to the same school. And of course, we have a few private schools or religious schools that people can choose to go to. I know that New York and places like Boston and Chicago are different. And you have magnet schools and charter schools and you have all these schools that students can choose from and some require tests and lotteries and all those things. Um, so for those who are listening, what is the public education landscape like in New York? 
In New York City, we have a public education system that supports 1.1 million ch children. So it is the largest public education system in America. And among that, parents have a lot of different options. They could choose to homeschool, they can choose the private school route, they can choose the Catholic school route. But if you want basically free education, you're either going to be matriculating through the public school system or you might prioritize char charter schools. So we're gonna focus our conversation around uh, the public schools because that makes up the bulk of the students here in New York City. Uh, so when we think about high quality education, which is my area of expertise, there's something called gifted and talented programs. And students from age four actually take an exam to place into the elite gifted and talented program starting from kindergarten. If you get into that track, you're literally in position for the elite high schools and on track for top colleges. Those are called citywide gifted and talented programs. The next tear down would be something called district-wide gifted and talented programs. So that's not necessarily going to be as uh, tailored, but it is going to have students who are of the same academic ability separated out from other students, right? Now you have, if you don't place into one of those two routes, you have something called general education. And those schools, you know, you may get in based on lottery, you may get in based on being in a certain school district, but screening is a big part of the New York City education system. That means we're looking at report card grades, we're looking at state exam scores, we're looking at attendance and punctuality, and most importantly, because we have so many children, and the reality is the way schools are funded is based on property tax, uh, parents fought for, for this for about 10 to 15 years ago for the opportunity to apply for schools that were outside of your district. Because if, if you had to only go to an, a neighborhood school, there would be whole communities that would not be given access to high quality education. So in New York City, you actually can apply for admission into a public education that's nowhere near where you live, as long as you have the academic background and the wherewithal to get there and to qualify. Wow. So, so different. <laughs> so, so different from what I know and from where I, the type of public school that I work for. So as you mentioned earlier, you are the founder of Admission Squad. What is the organization's mission and what were you seeing in public education that inspired you to create the nonprofit? I will start off with my story. I was raised in a single parent household. Um, my mom obviously was a mom of three girls and had to go to work. So she really wasn't in a position to prioritize this research around which schools to apply to and how to make sure that me and my sisters were best positioned. So it really was a parent and the PTA at my middle school that stepped in and said, this young lady is brilliant and has the ability to go to something called a specialized high school. So here in New York City, we kind of talked about the high level of what it looks like, but we didn't get into the nitty gritty of the high school landscape. There are these eight elite high schools called specialized high schools. I'll name a few, Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, Brooklyn Tech, Brooklyn Latin. And basically the only way to get into these eight schools is to take one test called the SHSAT, the Specialized High School Admissions Test. You take it in eighth grade in October and you have to score exceptionally high, like basically like top 5% of, of the entire testing pool. And so with that, if you get into one of these schools, you are getting like STEM training. If you wanna become an, a full stack web developer, you wanna go on to become a lawyer, a doctor, whatever, this is the best training, the best free training available. And so I got into Bronx Science, which was the number two specialized high school at the time. I was able to take six APs, honors classes, college classes, study abroad. You know, I literally had a college high quality education in high school. And that's what got me into Duke. It's what prepared me for the rigor of Duke University. And I just felt like I really lucked out. And so here I was on Wall Street, working as a consultant, seeing all of my friends go on to be successful. And I'm seeing fewer students who look like me, not only place into elite schools, but also make it into these professional settings. So as I decided, as I went into, you know, Teach for America, working in the charter school movement, I felt that what charter schools are doing, and this, everyone has a place in this industry, but what I saw was kind of this very, you know, disciplinarian, uh, oppressive way that those schools are being uh, cultivated and those children are not really being raised up to be innovators, leaders, 
students who can think outside the box, right? It's, it's a lot of rote memorization and a lot of, you know, disciplinary tactics that actually stifle creativity. And I literally had a moral dilemma with working for an, an institution like that. So I personally was like, no, I, this is not who I am. This doesn't even reflect the type of education that I receive. I have to do something about this. There is a whole nother audience of children who are high performing, who are not being challenged because they're in the minority, just like I was. And I wanna make sure that there is a space for them. So that's like the impetus behind why I decided to found my company at Mission Squad, you know, and it just started off as like, just, you know, working with a friend. We were trying to get some students into top high schools. I was a math expert. I had an, a friend who was an English expert and we just tried every single year. We realized, wow, these folks can't really afford what it would really cost to get them ready. So I decided to turn it into a nonprofit so that we would be positioned to um, accept donations and the funding required to really do a good job. Mm. So the average educator, unless they teach business courses, you know, courses in accounting, entrepreneurship, finance, don't come to the table with a lot of business information, a lot of understanding of how to run a business. They know curriculum, they know their subject area, they know classroom management, but that business piece is something that they actually have to go out and do the work of researching. How long did it take you to learn the business side of creating a nonprofit? And how long did it take you to go from idea to actually being up and running? So I'll start off by saying I'm different because I'm a numbers girl. So I think in numbers all day. So we can kind of like go deep into like what that really means. Um, and anything I don't know, I hire out for. So even the formation of the nonprofit, we just found a company who knew how to fill out the paperwork for us. Yes, it costs, I think around $3,000, which for some may be a lot. But for us, we were like, hey, if we have this, then we're obviously going to be in a position to accept more money. So this is what we call an investment. So we did not get bogged down with stuff that we didn't need to learn how to do. So I would always recommend hire out when you need the support. Aside from that, there is a metric that teachers or whoever is trying to start a business needs to understand. It's called a profit margin. And a profit margin in a basic sense is I'm going to spend money and I'm going to earn money. And out of what I earned, how much did it cost, right? So you want to you wanna capture as much of what you're earning as possible. Let's, let's put it in numbers. So let's say to run this class cost me $100, but I was able to generate $1,000. I'm now keeping $900. That is a 90% profit margin. That is excellent. But if you are making $1,000 and spending $1,000, <laughs> you are broke, okay? You are just breaking even. Why are you even doing this, right? So you need to just master that basic concept, right? Because that's when you're actually in profit mode. And so before I even had a nonprofit, we were already, I was already in profit mode. That's just kind of how I think. I figured out, okay, how much do I need to earn? And how can I minimize the expenses? And if I can do this and duplicate it over and over again, there would be enough for me to have a whole company. And so that is like, if you can't get that at a foundational level, we have a problem. And I do see a lot of folks struggling with that, like being very passionate about the work that they do, but what they're earning, they're entirely spending, or in some cases spending more than what they're earning. That's what we call debt. So we don't want to do that. So just even understanding that simple idea of what is a profit margin and how do I make sure that I come into this already being profitable just because it says nonprofit doesn't mean you don't make a profit. I run my company as a for profit in terms of the business structure behind it and what the numbers and the margins look like to ensure that we will continue to have what we call sustainability. I hear, I hear, hey, I tell educators all of the time when they sort of push back on the idea of becoming an entrepreneur and creating side hustles that I tell them your own school district, though it may be legally classified 
uh, as a nonprofit entity, your school system is a business. And if they get budget cuts, then they cut teachers or they cut programs. <laughs> and so they need to under, you know, think of it that way to understand that you too may be someone who gets a pink slip because teacher units have been cut. So to really sort of, sort of think about what they do in that mindset so that they can sort of move beyond the idea of it is a betrayal of of what they're doing of why did they become an educator so i'm glad you i'm glad you brought that up so i, I want to ask you now about like the work you do i saw a youtube video i, I saw you on the whiteboard i saw you working it out uh Tell us about the programming uh, and the services that you offer. I am so excited to share that our program has exploded during this period of quarantine. So I can share where we started. We never did one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We always did groups and it goes back to the profit margin guys. It's just very simple math. Um, so we were always committed to how can we provide a service that's affordable for our community? You know, folks who I can identify with, I am my customer. So I remember what it was like with my mom as a single mom, not really being able to afford Kaplan, Silverton Learning Center, all these like high level test prep companies. So I said, all right, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that company that, you know, is really blocking out my own community. At the same time, we have a bottom line. <laughs> so we had to somehow find a balancing ground and that sweet spot for us was was groups so for the years we were providing in-person group tutoring to and predominantly on the weekends we most recently about two years ago launched what we call a summer boot camp so that's like a five-week intensive monday through thursday from about 8 a.m to like 2 p.m and that was a phenomenal experience but for the last seven years i've been dreaming of online learning and the reason why it has been so important for me is because our mission is to serve black and brown students across all five boroughs. We serve other races too, but my goal is to get these schools diversified because it's only fair. When we look at the New York City education system, 70% of those public school students are black and Latino, yet less than 10% are making it into these elite high schools. So there's a clear inequity. So we are formed to address that shortfall. From that standpoint, when we look at in-person education, we're always limited. We're limited by teachers not being able to get to our office. We're limited by students not being able to commute because parents have to go to work and they're concerned if the children are gonna be on the train. So we had all these limitations that's really preventing us from truly reaching our mission. So in this age of quarantine, uh, we were able to shift our entire program online. It's not something that I didn't know about. It was more so parents were resistant to the idea of online learning actually being effective. And while that is debatable, I've been on a mission to prove that it actually is. So our program this past summer supported about 140 students in a completely online learning environment. So it's basically a micro school. And it was from Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. The students had a break and the, uh, you know, the teachers also had their break. They were able to work online. We also had interns to support our work and it was phenomenal. I mean, the testimonials, not just by the students, by the teachers as well. Like I just actually met with the teacher a few minutes ago and she's like, Ty, what you have done, there's schools in the DOE who haven't figured it out yet. So just giving me a pat on the back for having thought through it, but I'm like, it's not that hard, guys. It's just, we need to just be flexible and adjust. So that is how we are moving forward. I know that it's uncomfortable for some families, but when we, when we, when we look at the mission of what we're really trying to do, every student deserves access to quality education. And unfortunately, it's just not, it's just not true that every school district is given that opportunity. So this is a way for us to actually close that gap um, and reach more students. I want to ask you about sort of the school or career counseling or services, you know, like when you're talking to a parent, it's one thing to say, hey, these are these elite schools, 
and there's a, a cutoff score that students need to have. There's another thing to talk to parents about how these schools will change the trajectory, not only of that student's life, but of your entire family lineage. If that student is able to get in that school and then go on to X, Y, and Z college and university. When you're talking to parents who, who may have no idea, right, who they themselves may have sort of preconceived notions about what does that mean, or who may even fear if my child goes there, my child is not going to want to come back to the neighborhood, or they're going to look at me differently, or whatever or fears or, or, or conversations they may be having in that way. How do you talk to parents to get them to understand the other aspects of going to that school beyond just saying this is the, the score that is needed? So I call it the mere exposure effect. I believe that a lot of what holds us back is, is, the, is the fact that we haven't been exposed to what's possible. So nine times out of 10, when we look at my Asian peers, you know, who are getting into these schools in droves, their brother, their sister, their cousin, their auntie, their mama, their daddy, they all went to specialized high schools, right? Or a private school, you know, it's the same concept. Whereas for the population that I serve, it's, it's far, they're far removed from someone who would have that experience. So it is a part of our programming to provide mentorship. It's three step, it's three phases uh, for our program. We have the test prep slash academic enrichment, we have the mentorship, and we have the parent advisory coaching. And the mentorship is so critical because the, a lot of times there's a huge belief gap. And for any of us who are trying to accomplish something that we've never seen before, we don't even have a concept of what it might even look like we need examples, real life, life examples of what it looks like to kind of help to build our confidence. So we have something called a mentor series where I typically host that and I'll bring in graduates of specialized high schools, graduates of elite colleges, folks who are working in industries that students aspire to. A lot of us when we were younger wanted to be the president of the United States, the doctor, the lawyer, the investment banker, all these things, but we never really met someone who looked like us that we could identify with that would give us that belief that it was possible for ourselves. So it is a part of our initiative to kind of have this army of mentors. We pull from current black and brown students at the high schools. We pull from early alumni, so very, you know, folks who are maybe one to two years into college. And we also get folks who are a little bit more mature. Um, to come back and they talk to our students and encourage them uh, where possible we'll hire them uh, but you know sometimes you won't get you know actual specialized high school graduates to work with us because they're off doing you know phenomenal things um, but where possible we are trying to you know get our children exposed to as much as possible uh, so that they feel comfortable with the idea and of course I do believe my story has a lot to do with our success uh, again, I'm a black I'm a black girl from Brooklyn, raised in a single parent household. Father was absent from since I was three, and despite all of those odds, I was valedictorian in middle school, the number one black student at Bronx Science. Went to Duke, majored in mathematics. That is not an easy major, okay, and still had this successful start to my career. I'm a best selling author. All of these things, it literally like it it defies all of the odds. And I just, I share my story and the story of others to show these children, if I could do it in my circumstance, you have more than enough at your fingertips to be successful. Mm. All right. If I had some tea, I'd take a sip right now. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I like that. And, and I really like the the whole focus on, like, you know, the representation. You know, a lot of things that when I talk to educators about, when they talk about the achievement gap, I like to focus on what I tell people, the hope gap. So that when kids don't see, as you mentioned, when they look around them and they don't see people who look like them in certain positions, what do they reach for? Because they don't have those models around. And when you're able, as you mentioned, to expose them to different people, places, and things, it is phenomenal. I, I remember 
going to walk into the fleet center. Now I was leaving the fleet center after taking the commuter rail and I was getting ready to hop on another train. I lived in Boston Mm -hmm. and I saw smoke coming off of the street. Now I have seen that in movies before. Did not know what that was until I'm looking at it. I'm like, that is coming from the subway. And I was like, wow. That experience just sort of put a new sort of perspective in me. And and being in Boston, traveling and doing all those things. I don't how can I say this? Because I don't I don't want to sound. <laughs> I, I don't want, I don't want pay, I don't want people to take this the wrong way, but I don't try to be as good as someone else. I know that I am. Right? I'm not, I do what I do. And that's because I've been able to have certain experiences that from walking away from them, I know. I belong in this room. I got this. Uh, okay, let's move on. No, I mean, you're. I just, <laughs> yeah. That's important yeah. because it's what we talk about with identity and knowing that I am successful, I am deserving, I am enough. And when we think about our ancestors and what they went through and the amount of resource that we have at our fingertips, I don't care what type of oppression you feel that you're in right now or what you feel is holding you back, we are dealing with far less than our ancestors dealt with. So when we can just look at it from that standpoint, we are in a period of abundance and we just have to choose to shift our mindset. So from that vantage point, absolutely, you have a right to say, I am enough, I am confident, I can do this, I can find the support that I need, I can ask for help and I can defy the odds. There is nothing holding me back except for myself. And I think that's important. Like that positive self-talk that you have for yourself is important. There's nothing to be ashamed about because there's too many of us who are kind of like counting ourselves out of opportunity. And you have other communities that are showing up front and center, whether they have the talent or not. So it is very important that we hear that, especially from a black man, that you have that, you walk with that sense of pride and confidence. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. I just don't want people to go like, oh, yeah, they're humble bragging. Yeah, they're humble bragging. <laughs> um, <laughs> that wasn't the, the point. It was just a matter that you said. I'm not. I ain't sweating it. Uh, so I, what do you hope for? when you look at the students that you worked with in the past and the students that you currently work with and will work with work with in the future, what do you hope for them? And what do you hope they take away from admission squad? So one thing I will say that I've made it very clear with my students, we ain't hoping for anything. This is an expectation. And when I expect something, you will deliver. Okay. So that's like a shift in language, right? Cause if you hope, there's a, there's a chance it may not happen. No, no, no. This is happening for these children. So what I call my work is the education to wealth pipeline. So I am giving you the education and positioning you in educational environments and helping you to make the right educational decisions so that you can be on track for multi-generational wealth. And what does that look like? Wealth is money, yes. So we talk about finances. A lot of our students, we've provided them with stock training. So they know how to invest. They know how to avoid debt. They know how to, like, which career. So my book, Who Am I? An A to Z Career Guide for Teens, literally coaches our students on which career paths will get them on the fast track to six figures. So not only are we helping them how to get the money, but we're also showing them how to keep the money. And then beyond that, we have an expectation of leadership. So even at the high school level, some of our students have already started businesses. They're speaking foreign languages. They've already like head up organizations within their schools or championed new initiatives, right? So all of that is a part of the mentorship and coaching once they place into these elite high schools. And so beyond that, what does it look like for them in the real world? They are expected to be industry disruptors. 
not all of them have to go on to become entrepreneurs, but I personally obviously model the importance of entrepreneurship and the freedom that it, it affords you to not only have, you know, the life that you desire, but also have the ability to impact the nation. And I, I come from a, that, that W.B. Du Bois mindset that if we, you gain access to this quality of this high quality of education, you have a responsibility to come back and help an, at least a thousand people. And my thing is, if I were to help at least a thousand and they go on to each help a thousand, we're now actually moving the needle in our black and brown communities. And that's what's most important to me. So I told them, I said, guys, I'm not asking you to go out and start big old companies because this is this is a lot of work. I'm not even going to front like my whole 20s went to business, you know, like just running my company. But you can be an entrepreneur. You can be, you know, speak up when you're in the boardroom. You can make sure you make it into some of these seats where you can allocate certain types of resources to your communities. Like you, you have like this opportunity of a quality education cannot go to waste. You have to leverage your platforms, leverage your influence. I don't care if you're influencing one person, a thousand people or a million people. Your, the responsibility is still the same. And so that is, that is what I leave all of them with. And I know that I model that. And so they know you know, what is that expectation? What does it look like? And I still balance my support to them and still have, you know, a social life and do all the other things that I want to do. But I'm, I show up for my community and I, 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 I expect them to do the same. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. I'm gonna let, we're going to let that breathe and marinate people. <laughs> we're, gonna, ooh, we're gonna let that just 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 feel that y'all feel it feel it right there you, you mentioned your book and so i i want you to like tell us the pain point behind writing in the book and and give us sort of <clears throat> if you will because i know you mentioned some things that are in there but sort of break down how that book is 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 a, a guide uh, for black and brown students. Absolutely. I went to Duke University, as I mentioned before, and I graduated with what turned into $143,000 of student loan debt. And my first job working for the government as a government consultant was $55,000. So, and again, I chose to not move forward with investment banking. If I were to do banking, I probably would have made $150,000. So I get it. So that was not the best decision, right? It was a lot of weird stuff happening and this lack of awareness of how the numbers were all going to make sense. I didn't, I didn't get that I was in debt that deep. So here I was, a senior, also graduating in the midst of a market crash because that's the 2008-2009 timeframe. And so many of my friends were getting laid off. You know, it was a lot happening. But there was a white pair of mine who graduated in the middle of a market crash making $250,000. And here I was making $55,000 with $140,000 of student loan debt. This is after interest, of course. And I'm like, what just happened here? Is it just white privilege or is there something else that I'm missing? So just fast forward, just in my, you know, the evolution of my career. Again, I'm looking at the investment banking opportunity that I had. I'm looking at consulting. I'm looking at my doctor friends. I'm looking at all these various pathways. And I feel like me and my friends, mostly immigrants, to be honest, or just first generation, you know, in an Ivy League, had no idea what we were doing. We were literally just painting the path as we went along. Additionally, I'm certain that there were folks who came before us who already went down the path, but where was this information? And so here I was working to address the first issue of getting students into the top high schools, but I knew that, okay, this is not, this is not it because I definitely was at Duke not knowing what to do. Like I was literally at Duke spending all this money, not really knowing how to leverage the resources at Duke. If it wasn't a, for a friend of mine who kind of pulled me into this organization called SEO, Sponsors for Educational Opportunity, I would not have even known about applying for investment banking. Mm. So I was like, a lot of this stuff is left up to chance and luck. And I'm not okay with that. Like I got lucky to an extent from, I'm a Christian woman, so I don't really call it luck. I call it being blessed and divine favor, but I still feel like, and they always say favor is not fair, but I'm like, come on, man. Like 
if a child has the ability, they deserve access, period. And that's where the book came in. So when, when the children gets, get, got into high school, we would start to host these like meetup um, groups just to check in. So we'll say, all right, how are you guys doing? All right, don't forget now, those, those, that PSAT matters, like not the SAT, but the PSAT, because if you score high enough, you can get scholarships. I didn't even know that, Miss Ty. And I'm like, well, we definitely told you two years ago, but he didn't remember. <laughs> or um, again, like make sure you're connecting with your professors because you're going to need to get those recommendations or make sure you get all these APs because that's going to help you stand out, right? So it's all this information that they're like, I didn't even think of that. Nobody told me. And I'm like, why do I keep hearing the same thing that no one's sharing information? And so there's a part of me that is, I'm aware that they just don't know, like the parents may not know. But there's another part of me that's clear that for the few of us who did have this opportunity, the information is not funneling backwards. So I decided, okay, like one, I can't keep doing all these meetups <laughs> because like I'm, ex I'm exhausted. I'm sorry guys, like I'm like so young and giving so much of myself to the community. Like we need to package this information <laughs> so that a lot of folks can benefit. And literally that was the basis behind the book. I was like, yo, there's all these six figure careers that I'm now aware of that I wasn't aware of back then. And I knew banking, yes, but I didn't know you could be a full stack web developer. Like I was taking computer classes, like I was coding, but I didn't know that that could turn into a lucrative career. I was just like, uh, I don't want to be in front of a computer all day. So I'm good, you know? And I wanted students to know, no, 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 this is good. Like digital marketing is a phenomenal arena. Um, user experience design is really cool. If you want to sell yachts, you can be a yacht broker, okay? You can do a lot of things. And then this young man, the white man who was making $250,000, like right when he graduated from Duke, I spoke to him and he had been working for that company since high school. So when we think about this idea of value add, which is really what we're talking to, like our educators who are listening in right now, you literally have to learn how to add value. You need to find market opportunities. You need to figure out what you know, what you can provide that the world needs or specific niche needs. And this young man happened to do that exceptionally well for this company to the point where he had what we call negotiating power. They mm. needed it. And because they needed him, he could charge for it. And so I, here I was like, well, why can't I earn more? <laughs> but like, I didn't have the experience. I didn't provide value to one company in that way where they absolutely needed me. So that was, those were some like really tough lessons that I don't regret. I'm very grateful for my experience because this is the insight that I'm able to share with others and I move differently. That's why I'm in, I'm an entrepreneur. I know how to add value. And if it wasn't this, I could go into another industry and find a way to add value. Like there is, there, unemployment doesn't exist in my world because I know how to add value. So I learned that lesson. Um, and I wanted as many of my students to understand that as well. Just because you go to school and get good grades does not mean you will be successful. That is the unfortunate reality. Those degrees are not worth what they used to be. You need to have skills. So we talk about that in the book. You need to focus on certain degrees because certain degrees are worth more. And you need to add value to the marketplace, get the experience in, get internships, do something with your summers, learn how to cultivate a network, right? These are all the things I didn't pick up until high school, I mean, college or after mm. college. So I wanted them to learn that in high school because my wealthy white peers came into Duke knowing how to do these things, which is why they were able to leverage those four years. So it's not fair. I, I understand the, you know, the impetus behind, you know, affirmative action, but it's not fair to let these children in and then they don't even know what to do with the opportunity. And that's really what's happening. And then from a community standpoint, we don't really have enough know-how in terms of how to support a student that's at Harvard University. So they're kind of there by themselves, just figuring it out. And that's a waste. It's a waste. And these are, ch the children are, are the assets of our community. So we need to ensure that they're kind of like coached in the right way. We, we talk about um, group economics and the fact that our, the black community need, really needs to look out for, for one another, but we don't even have leaders. We don't have politicians 
that are really informed in a way that can look out for our agenda. We don't have businesses that you know are fully endorsed by the black community. We don't have a lot of know-how in terms of what it really takes. So we don't that that's why we really we are a leaderless community. And that's a problem. So I feel like that work starts at the K through 12 education level. And that's what I'm I'm working aggressively to solve. So no, it's not just getting them into a top high school and a top college because no shade, these colleges will take your money. It's making sure that they have a foundation in who they are as little young black queens and kings, and they have an expectation to lead and disrupt and to own. Mm. Oh, people. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. <laughs> Go do the, people. The Lamium, the Lamium right there. Uh, <laughs> all right, Ty. So before we go, what is your advice, your call to action for that educator? They're in the classroom. They are, I mean, they could be restless. Uh, they could even just be at a point to where they have, they felt that they've given all that they can at their current position and there's something they want to do more. And again, the idea of creating a for-profit business in terms of, you know, selling lesson plans, uh, speaking, consulting, that might not appeal to them, but the idea of, hey, I can create a nonprofit. I can still make that impact that I want to as to why I actually became an educator. What is your advice to them on how they should go about starting? Sure. When we think about starting a nonprofit, because a lot of people want to start this whole nonprofit thing. So let me be super transparent. It costs quite a bit of money to sustain any business. But if we're talking about a nonprofit, it's because there's some sort of market, equ- market equilibrium in where your target market does not have the money to pay for what you're trying to offer. I'm just assuming that because if, if they did have the money, then you would do it as a for-profit. So if that's the case, you're going to have to secure these funds from another vehicle. Mm-hmm. So the question is, Do you have the network, whether it's people you know or you know someone who knows someone, to amass the capital needed to sustain the day-to-day operations of this company? That's the biggest question that a lot of us need to ask ourselves because we can get into the nonprofit. I can tell you, like, even just filing the annual reports, you know, both the state and the federal um, forming the nonprofit, the oversight, the bookkeeping, the accounting. And I don't, I don't want this to intimidate anyone. I just need you to know you need cash flow. No business can survive without cash flow. So for just when I first started, I did have clients who were paying. This was not a situation because I'm just seeing, I'm hearing, I have a couple people who are asking me for coaching on this. And you know, they're kind of coming with the mindset of like, oh, I just want to do something for the world. And, you know, no, my clients can't really pay. So I need to find it elsewhere. Right. I had to make it through the first couple years of my business because I really wasn't able to secure funding. It could be for a couple different reasons. Maybe I didn't have the network when I was younger. I didn't have the know how. I'm also going to consider I'm a black female entrepreneur and maybe people don't want to give me money right away just for having an idea. You know, that could be true. Like in in reality, what may may or may not, I just know it was my truth. That is what my story was. In the beginning, I was not able to secure funding. And I knew as a black female entrepreneur and the the system that we live in, I'm going to need some results. So there were at least three years of me structuring the program and having exceptional results, but also needing to sustain because I had to pay my teachers. I had to pay for the location. I had to pay for the materials. So I needed to get our clients to actually pay into the business for us to make it through those three years. And in us doing that, somewhere along the way, I was able to meet folks who really 
were passionate about the work and was able to help us structure our budget and secure the money. So I say all that to say, you know, you don't want to look at this, you know, just kind of laissez-faire and just kind of hope your way through it. No, you want to have an actual business plan. You want to get people bought in. There's an army of supporters behind my company. So you need to get like at least 25 people who see your vision, agree with your vision, and will back your vision. If you were to put, you know, a GoFundMe or some sort of a crowdfunding campaign out there, even to raise $10,000, do you feel like you have the network or support base to, to get you there? Uh, and if not, what can you do right now to start networking uh, with people who actually have access to resources? So that's monetary resources, but that's also, you know, some of the things that you're going to need to run your company, whether that's a space, books, printing, right? All these things, we have people who can give it to us at a nominal rate. But if, that was that, if that's not the case, you still need to find a way to fund this, this project, okay? So that's kind of where I would start. Like, let's say, you know, uh, just a quick idea, like you seeing a gap that's happening in your school, like, wow, like I really think students right now, let's say like we're in this age of Corona, students need socio-emotional health right now because they're kind of not really faring well with, you know, online learning. And that's the idea that you have. The first question is, will parents pay for that? Like, can you, because that's your customer, that's your immediate end user. Will they pay for it? And if they're not going to pay for it, who will? Mm -hmm. Who cares enough about this idea that you can go to them and I, I do everything with PowerPoint. So put your, you know, some sort of <laughs> presentation together and you're trying to, you have to sell this idea unless you're funding it out of your own pocket. And there's a lot of people funding these nonprofits based on their own salaries. That's not, I'm not interested in that. I've never had to do that. Everything I've paid for came from the company. Like I got the, the parents to pay or a donor to pay or a grant, right? Like you have to find it. So with that, you know, really be thoughtful about, okay, if, if they're not paying, who is? And mm -hmm. how can I create a couple different streams of revenue up front? It's all in the plan. It's not gonna happen overnight, but if you have a plan, at least you know where you're going. So that's, that's kind of what I would, that's how I would initially advise, um, you know, even for the initial formation fees, just try it out. Like whatever the idea is, put together a circle, let's say this, this social, uh, so, social emotional learning, put together a circle of 15 children, charge them whatever it would require to get to this $3,000. Maybe it's multiple sessions, but I oh for me, anything I want to do, I earn the money. So you do enough to get the $3,000 and then you go form your nonprofit and then you keep going, you know, cause now you've tested out the idea that there's a, there's a desire for this thing. You put it out there, nobody responds. I'm not saying give up. Maybe you want to share it with a couple more people. But if you see that no one's responding after like a good hundred people, maybe this is not really, you know, a need after all. <laughs> so <laughs> go in a different direction, okay? So just like for-profit, there's a lot of like crossover between nonprofit and for-profit, really. The only difference is you pretty much have to spend what you earn, but you can still take a for-profit mentality to growing a nonprofit. Mm. People. <laughs> Thank you, Ty, for coming on. I'm so excited. I, yeah, I'm, I'm releasing this. Yeah, this is coming out. What's the day? Today, Monday. Yeah, this is coming out Wednesday. I can't hold on to this one. Awesome. <laughs> it's coming out, people. Uh, Ty, it's been so awesome. Thanks for coming on. For sure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, people, you know how I do this. This podcast episode is going to be on Apple Podcasts. Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Simplecast, Stitcher, and Spotify. I need you to subscribe, follow, and share. I do like the stars, but can a brother get some reviews? Can I get some comments? Because I'm trying to be found, and I'm trying to get Oprah on the show. And I want her to know that I'm doing big things around here. Again, I'd like to thank my guest, Ty Abrams, for coming on and dropping so many gems. And I would like to thank you again for rocking with me for the past six years on the Dr. Real Show, the mobile university for entrepreneurs. As always, people, invest in you. EDU, peace.